Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, the World Trade Organization rules against country of origin labeling in the United States. Both its supporters and opponents comment. In the food factor, cooking with herbs. It's not hard and we'll tell you how you can grow your own. In southern gardening, ornamental grasses, they come in all sizes, textures and colors. In the markets, some optimists think corn could rally in the next month as Pond Bank catfish prices slip slightly for a second month. In the feature segment, the Great Mississippi Tea Company, this unique operation is in its third year of a plan to grow high quality tea in the Brookhaven area. All tea comes from the same plant. So if you have black tea, green tea, oolong, yellow, uh, white teas, they're all the same plant. It's just how you process it. Then you can add flavorings on top. It's wildly popular in the United States with the flavorings, primarily because there's a lot of chlorine chemicals in our water, so it's kind of masking those bad tastes. But what we're aiming for is really some high-grade special or specialty tea. Good day everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to Farm Week. As expected, the World Trade Organization has issued another ruling against country of origin labeling laws in the United States. Artis, the United States lost its latest appeal to the WTO on Monday. Cool requires where an animal was born, raised and slaughtered to be printed on the package label. The WTO said this type of labeling creates a bias against meat from Canada and Mexico. The news was met with predictable reactions by Cool's supporters and opponents in the United States. Tuesday, Congressman Michael Conaway, the Republican chairman of the House Agriculture Committee, introduced a bill to repeal Cool. The committee approved it the next day by a 38 to 6 vote. It now goes to the House floor for debate. Conaway says Cool should be repealed to avoid trade sanctions. He says evidence shows the requirement actually costs the meat industry. The ranking Democrat on the House Ag Committee, Colin Peterson of Minnesota, said he was disappointed in the WTO ruling, but he would oppose efforts to fully repeal Cool. He said there is still time before any trade sanctions would go into effect, and the Congress should take that time to consider how to change Cool. The American Farm Bureau, RCAF USA, and the National Farmers Union remain in support of country of origin labeling. RCAF opposes Conaway's bill, RCAF says how can the WTO say cool impedes Canadian and Mexican cattle imports when those imports hit a record level in 2014. The National Cattlemen's Beef Association and the National Pork Producers Council want to see cool repealed. These groups say the cost of keeping track of the origin of meat, where it was raised and slaughtered, actually costs the meat industry money. And the USA Rice Federation and the National Milk Producers Federation also support the repeal of cool. Let's check on the Mississippi Weekly Crop Report from the Mississippi Ag Statistics Service in Jackson. This report reflects conditions as of last Sunday, May 17th. Most of the state's planting is ahead or right on the five-year average. As we look at Mississippi topsoil moisture, surplus in 20% of the state, adequate 57, short though, 18%. As we look at Mississippi corn, Almost all of the crop is planted, 91% of it has emerged, and that was up six points in one week. As we look at Mississippi rice, uh, far ahead of schedule, 93% is planted, that's far ahead of the 81% five-year average. As we look at Mississippi soybeans, 79% of the crop is planted, also ahead of the five-year average, 60% of the crop has emerged. Mississippi cotton, 70% of the crop planted as of May 17th, also ahead of average, and emergence is running at 49%, also ahead. As we look at Mississippi peanuts, 44% of the crop planted as of May 17th, and emergence is at 18%, and both those are on the five-year averages. As we look at Mississippi sweet potatoes, planting just getting underway, 8% complete as of May 17th. 
Mississippi wheat, 96% of the crop has headed as of the 17th. 57% of the crop has colored. Most people have a drawer or cabinet full of herbs and spices, but they don't necessarily know how to use them. In this week's episode of The Food Factor, Natasha Haynes of the Mississippi State University Extension Service shows us how to use herbs in cooking. She also has a special guest who knows how to grow them. I've always heard that fresh herbs can add a new dimension to your food. I wonder though, how hard would it be to grow your own? Maybe Gary Botman with Southern Gardening would help. Ah. Natasha, that's a great question. Common herbs are really easy to grow, whether you do it in containers or out in the garden. Some herbs prefer consistent moisture, such as mint or thyme, while others like it a little drier, like sage and rosemary. Herbs are easy to grow using potting mix, so they can be grown in containers just about anywhere there's adequate light. If you follow these suggestions, you can grow them too. Sure hope this helps. Sure it does, Gary. I'm so excited! I just love adding fresh parsley to meat dishes, oregano and basil to Italian foods, and cilantro to homemade salsa to give it that extra zing. But of course, my favorite is adding freshly cut peppermint to a cold glass of sweet tea. Fabulous. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. Natasha says when shopping for herbs, be sure to look for those with vibrant color and avoid those that are wilting, yellowing, or have black spots. Many gardeners don't get very excited about ornamental grasses. In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman tells us about some grasses that can make a big impact in your landscape. People yawn oh, when the talk turns to using grasses in the garden. But many ornamental grasses are fantastic landscape choices and can really add color and textural interest to any garden. Penicetum is a grass that offers many different varieties. It must be treated as an annual everywhere except right along the coast. It will grow up to three feet tall and exhibit a wispy flowing grace of color and texture. Penicetum rubrum has upright arching burgundy tinted foliage that has that classic true fountain grass habit. Penicetum fireworks is a great choice for its pink and white variegation. Penicetum skyrocket has a beautiful variegation of green leaves with white striped margins that will form a beautiful arching clump. Now how about the unique variegation of gold breeze miscanthus? Alternating bands of golden yellow and green is really different than the lengthwise variegation of the penicetum selections. If you're looking for more interesting grasses, check out these beautiful varieties. No other grass displays refined texture as feather grass with bright green blades resembling delicate filaments that softly arch outward and in the summer displays an explosion of feathery panicles. Golden variegated sweet flag is actually not a grass at all, but is called grass-like. It's a perennial that works great in combo containers and as edging. As you can see, grasses don't have to be boring. Plant some this year. I know I'm going to. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Like Gary says, choose ornamental grasses based on where you use them. If you're looking for specimen plants, well, just determine the size and height and the color that will go in the area where you're placing it. In our feature segment today, I travel to Brookhaven to visit a farm that is one of the few in the United States that grows tea. Time now for the markets with Leighton. You say there's at least one optimistic soul as far as corn prices are concerned. That's right, Artis, and you will all hear from him in just a few more minutes. Also ahead in this segment, U.S. catfish prices slip further. Milk export demand picks up. And the wheat market struggles as the month of May begins to wind down. 
For the second month in a row, U.S. farm-raised catfish prices are slipping. In April, producers in the United States received a pond bank price of $1.13 per pound, that for premium size live fish. Now that is a drop of four cents per pound from what was paid one year ago. Farm sales totaled 26 million pounds round weight in April, an increase of 8% from a year ago. Processor sales were heading the other direction though, dropping a little over 8% to 11.4 million pounds. Two states are stiffening their country of origin labeling law as far as catfish. The goal is to make it easier for consumers to know where their catfish originated. Soon, restaurant operators in both Alabama and Arkansas will have to identify the country of origin of both catfish and catfish-like species such as bassa and traw. The Alabama law goes into effect August 1st. In Arkansas, the change does not become effective until January 1st of 2016. Moving to dairy production, there is some debate now about whether the milk market is in a slow uptrend or not. An increase in exports has definitely helped prices recently. Analyst Naomi Bloom offered this assessment on Market to Market recently. Saw the June contract this week get up to $17.50. And, but then on the same week, we fell all the way apart down to $16.50. So the overall, we're grinding in a nice, kind of a slow uptrend. However, our production is still humongous, 1% higher than year ago levels. And the drought in California, we are seeing animals being called there, and so their production is down. However, the rest of the country is able to more than make up for what's been lost. Overall exports were up 33% from the previous month, but still, if you look at it from, uh, from the past year, we're down 8%, but um, firm. Moving now to trivia, it's time for a break. And this week, our subject is the animal causing much destruction in Mississippi, the wild hog. Here's the quiz question. What is the best season for trapping wild hogs? Is the answer A, winter, B, spring, C, summer, or D, fall? You'll find out here in a few more minutes. We're going to pause for a short break on farm wheat. Coming up, we'll look at the calendar and the rest of the markets. Leighton Span says wheat is struggling, but a rally could be on the way for corn. In the feature segment today, the Great Mississippi Tea Company. The Brookhaven Company is one of the few places in the U.S. growing tea. From our family to yours, Mississippi's farmers believe the best produce and livestock are grown right here at home. With ms.foodsearcher.com, you're only a click away. Using your smartphone, you'll be connected to hundreds of families and small businesses dedicated to providing you with fresh local foods. Produce, meats, fish, dairy, agritourism, community markets, and more are right at your fingertips no matter where you are. ms.foodsearcher.com. Before we get back to the markets, let's look at the Farm Week calendar. A rural tourism workshop will take place June 1st and 2nd in West Point, Mississippi. The workshop will focus on tourism marketing trends and budget-friendly advertising strategies. It's designed for tourism professionals, educators, and others interested in promoting Mississippi tourism. There's no registration fee, but you need to pre-register by May 28th. We will have a link on our Farm Week website calendar. Free youth ATV safety classes are being offered June through the 8th through the 13th in West Point. They'll take place at the Jimmy, Jimmy Bryan 4-H Youth Complex behind the Mossy Oak Mall. They're open to 8 to 16 year olds. Two classes a day will be held at 9 a.m. and 2 p.m. Those who complete the classes will receive a free helmet. Pre-registration is a must. We will have the phone number on our calendar or you can contact your county office of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. We focus on the corn market next on Farm Week. Brugler Marketing says the rain makes grain mentality and a sharply higher dollar on Monday and Tuesday this week are, as they put it, feeding the bear in the corn market. Relatively cheap wheat and dried distiller's grains are also described as a natural drag on corn prices right now. Analyst Mark Gold, however, remains an optimist. 
He thinks we might even see a rally in corn between now and the June 30th acreage report from the USDA. The way I look at this market, I don't see any reason why we can't have a rally between maybe now and maybe into the planting numbers into June 30th. I think then, if we get the rally then, then we, maybe we break it because I believe we're going to have a lot of corn planted in this country. But in the meantime, until we get some other real news, the dollar's been backing off. We got down to about 94 cents. If we can get that down to 90, that'll inspire some, some export buying, hopefully. And the exports haven't been that bad. So, you know, why not look for a little bit of a rally here? On the other hand, in the grain sector, we have the struggles that continue for the wheat market. Extension Ag economist Brian Williams has been monitoring this market. He answers some questions about it for Farm Week. Well, Brian, what did the May USDA reports have to say about wheat? Well, it kind of gave us a first look at the 2015-2016 crop year. Um, the yields were uh, expected to be slightly lower than a year ago at 43.5 bushels per acre. Um, production slightly higher than last year, but that's mainly because of a 1.6 million acre increase in harvested acres. Uh, the food feed and residual use as well as exports were all up over year over year, so that's kind of a good sign for our demand. Uh, and then the, the bottom line uh, export or ending stocks were about 84 million bushels higher uh, than a year ago. Last week we seem to see what some are calling some real energy under the wheat market. Um, yeah. Would you agree with that? What sparked that? Yeah, um, well for a couple of days after this report come out, prices stayed fairly steady, but then they really saw a 30 cent spike um, in one day. And a lot of that was because of, of weather rather than the report itself. Now, that brings me to my next question, crop condition, because uh, the wide variety, when we talk about whether there's been drought impacting wheat, there's been, of course, too much rain in some places, and, yeah. uh, and then the normal situation we have in the spring. How is all that going to play with this market? Well, the, the big thing right now that's, that's playing into this is the rain, the heavy rain. Um, the vast majority of all of our, our wheat acres in the U.S. have seen some rain, and with that heavy rain, it can knock the wheat down, and, and that's where the fear is, is that some of the wheat's being damaged by this rain. So trend-wise, what might we see with, with the kind of weather we've had and how this market is shaping up? Well, looking at the, uh, the forecast for the next week, it looks like we're going to see that rain continue. Um, so that, that could keep our, our prices coming up, or at least staying where they are. Um, but then after that, as we get closer and closer to harvest, I think we might see them come back down a little bit again. And final question, the export market, how is that picture looking? Um, it's, it's struggling. The exports are struggling right now. Um, in the, the USDA report, they were revised down, and then we got news last week that Russia was actually going to remove an export tax, and so that puts their wheat on the market, and that's probably going to hurt our exports a little bit more. Even, even more so. Back to the trivia quiz to wrap things up in the markets for this week. And the right answer is A. Extension professor Dr. Bronson Strickland says winter is the best season to trap because most of the foods that hogs relish are limited. In Brookhaven, Mississippi, two ambitious entrepreneurs are going where no grower has gone before when it comes to commercial tea production. Jason McDonald and Timothy Gibson have started the Great Mississippi Tea Company. They did that in 2012, and their first crop shows great promise in producing high-quality tea. The two have consulted the Mississippi State University Extension Service and other experts in their venture. Farmix Amy Taylor first brought us his story last September. Freshly brewed tea has been a beverage of choice in many cultures for thousands of years. It can be served hot or cold, and comes in pretty much any flavor to suit your fancy. Tea has been used as a sleep aid, stress relief, and even for doctoring sunburn. It's a staple item at social gatherings, particularly in the South. And after a hard day's work in the hot sun, a nice glass of iced tea is hard to beat. In Brookhaven, Mississippi, Jason McDonald and Timothy Gibson decided to launch the Great Mississippi Tea Company, where they grow camellia plants for making tea. Jason McDonald tells the story behind this crazy idea. Well, after Hurricane Katrina, we uh, lost a lot of our timber in Walthall County, and so we'd been looking for a crop that would withstand a hurricane. And we were on vacation in Charleston in 2002, and we saw the Charleston tea plantation. So we uh, 
we dec or decided to take a visit. So we went out there and they said that it was a camellia, needed high heat, humidity, and acidic soil, and uh, ample rainfall. And I said, well, sounds like we found a crop. So we called up Rebecca Bates, our extension agent, and said, we've got this crazy idea, will it work? <laughs> and she said, well, we'll try. I was thrilled. My background is horticulture. So I knew that tea came from a camellia plant. I knew that we grew camellias very well in Mississippi and in Lincoln County, but I really didn't know um, about the process of growing tea, the culture of tea. I didn't quite understand how it was harvested. The soil type it needs is, is a good sandy loam. Uh, it needs an acid soil, and we certainly have plenty of that here in Lincoln County. Bates says the soil was sent to the soil testing lab at Mississippi State University Extension Service to be analyzed for nutrient levels and determine if anything needed to be added, such as lime or fertilizer. This service is available to all Mississippi landowners who can send dirt samples to the lab for analysis and recommendations. Co-founder Timothy Gibson explains more about getting started. We had to build planters because of uh, drainage issues. We've had to cut in different uh, drains to get the water away. Uh, have everything potted over from little pots to big pots, uh, planting bigger plants in the ground um, so that we can take cuttings from them later. For irrigation, a low voltage system is used which comes on automatically each day and has a built-in fertilization system. Additionally, Jason McDonald explains the need for the shade cloth. When the plants are as small as they are, if they go in full sun, it can burn them back and kill the plants. It's also important because when it gets 108 degrees with heat index, it offers a little bit of shade for the cooler weather. It's also the irrigation comes on at the hottest part of the day, so the mist and, and the shade together, it actually will cool off the area about 20 degrees. The tea company has a total of 30,000 plants. And at two years of age, the oldest portion of the crop is still a year away from harvest. Timothy Gibson explains the harvesting process. You have hand processing and mechanical processing. Um, hand processing is exactly what it sounds like. You have people that get out there and they pluck the first two little leaves and the one little bud that's coming up. They pluck it off, throw it in a basket, uh, then it gets laid out so that it can lose a lot of moisture. And then it gets broken up and let oxidize and that's where it turns brown. Mechanizing does the same thing. Additionally, Jason McDonald describes the company's goals after harvesting the plants. All tea comes from the same plant. So if you have black tea, green tea, oolong, yellow, uh, white teas, they're all the same plant. It's just how you process it. Then you can add flavorings on top. It's wildly popular in the United States with the flavorings, primarily because there's a lot of chlorine chemicals in our water, so it's kind of masking those bad tastes. But what we're aiming for is really some high-grade special or specialty tea that uh, some things would be cold brewed so you still get the flavors. Uh, flavorings around the world are not really sought after, but we will have a line of tea bags and things for American use that would be flavored. and. We'll also have orthodox and bulk tea. McDonald hopes to harvest an experimental tea crop by 2015, then offer small batches to limited customers in 2018 and ramp up to full production by 2020. He says they want to use a mechanizing process for harvesting that doesn't sacrifice the quality that hand processing would produce. Another goal is to reach out to the community. We think we've got something that's pretty unique and people want to come out. We've got some plans to uh, talk with retired teachers and getting some lesson plans drawn up for school groups. Uh, we'll also offer wedding space, meeting spaces. Uh, we'll do tea uh, processing workshops where people can come out and pick the tea by hand and make the tea so it's something special they can take home. Uh, we'll have farm tours, hopefully. I'm all about farmer's markets, so I would love to see it become a farmer's market product. These type products could be sold uh, at the market by the pound or just in small quantities. Uh, I would hope to see eventually that he could actually bottle some, some teas, uh, some chai teas. Finally, Jason McDonald says in addition to guidance from MSU Extension Service, they were blessed to receive advice from tea consultant Nigel Mellican of the United Kingdom, as well as a grant from the Mississippi Department of Agriculture and Commerce. Until 2020 rolls around, we'll have to wait patiently before we see how the tea turns out. From Brookhaven, Mississippi, I'm Amy Taylor reporting.
And you can watch this story on the Great Mississippi Tea Company on our Facebook page, uh, Farmwick website, or YouTube. We'll also have the contact uh, information website and Facebook information for the company. Our website address is farmweek.msucares.com. We're also available at twitter.com slash farmweek. So Leighton, a uh, bit of an update on the story. Harsh winter, down to eight degrees, I think on two occasions. Some of the plants uh, were killed by the winter. So see, they're in the process of trying to determine which tea plants work best in our area because we get the extremely cold temperatures, but then we get the temperatures that bounce back up, you know, a day or two later. Kind of harsh. So they're working on that. They're also using uh, geese to weed their geese. <laughs> yes, to weed the crop. And I think we need to run down and take a look at that. That's, you know, that's an old time, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that's an old time uh, technique for cotton farming. So uh, we look forward but to it. At least they haven't had to withstand a hurricane yet. We haven't crossed so that far. bridge yet. No. We are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our next show, we can't make maple syrup in Mississippi, but we're glad our neighbors to the north can. Vermont says that it's the state's number one ag enterprise. See the unique way this agricultural product is harvested and processed. In the food factor, beef cuts find out what they are and how it affects their cooking. In southern gardening, native plants. These hardy plants have a place in your landscape. For the rest of the Farmer Crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.